Folks, welcome to today's Crease Brown Bag. Uh, this is our second to last uh, brown bag of the semester. Um, our speaker today is Austin Sharon. He is a PhD candidate in Geography and Atmospheric Sciences. I'm just still getting used to saying that. <laughs> <laughs> like the rest of us. <laughs> Austin says his research is concerned primarily with social spatial identities, how they are shaped by ethnicity borders, uh, territorialization, and popular discourse. Uh, his regional interests <coughs> lie broadly in Russia and former Soviet Union, and his graduate research has been pr principally focused upon uh, Crimea and Siberia. Uh, he spent most of last year in Ukraine <laughs> working on a project directed at exploring the identity of IDPs who fled Crimea after Russia's annexation. Uh, and here's the part I really like, the, the project was funded by the National Science Foundation. <laughs> I, <didn't say laughs> I like that too. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for the introduction. Barton, thank you all for having me today. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you about uh, the work I did this past year. This is one of my first opportunities to really present on this. Um, as it is, I'm still working through a lot of the material I've gathered. I've got some preliminary um, results to show you and some of the major themes that emerged from my work um, in, the, in the field in Ukraine this past year. Um, I do want to mention that this does, did receive funding from the National Science Foundation, um, so I'm very thankful for them. Um, I'll, I'll start by explaining some of these images here. These are all from a single event. This is the uh, commemoration on May 18th of this year. This is the date, the anniversary of the deportation of the Crimean Tatars, a very important group that I'll be talking a lot about today, who, uh, who were deported from Crimea um, in, in the year just after um, uh, World War II in that period, 1944. And uh, on this day now they commemorate uh, this anniversary. They used to do it uh, in Crimea. Now they're limited in their ability to do so there, uh, given the occupation, the Russian occupation there. So they hold it, um, a large celebration, no, well, a large commemoration rather, in uh, Kiev. And so these are images from that day. We've got not only Crimean Tatars here on the right, children draped in the Crimean Tatar flag, but other Crimeans, uh, you can't really read it, but this guy's shirt says uh, Crimean Ukrainian. Um, so others coming out to support the Crimean Tatar, show solidarity. You've got a sign that says Ukra uh, Ukrainians and Crimeans are one state, one Maidan, the word meaning square, both in the Ukrainian and um, Crimean Tatar language. So sort of showing a cultural linkage between these two groups. Um, so um, it's a bit of, a, of an introduction with those images there, but let me give you some background on Crimea and the area we're talking about here. So um, many of you I know who come to these talks and who are involved in this part of the world know at least something about Ukraine and Crimea, maybe some of the recent events there, but let me just give a, a broad overview. Uh, this is a region here, uh, a peninsula linked to uh, the Ukrainian mainland by a small isthmus. Um, given some of its history here, it uh, was part of the Crimean Khanate for, for many centuries, from 1449 to 1783. This is a period after the fall of the Mongol Horde, the Golden Horde that uh, uh, came after that. Uh, it was made up uh, of descendants of the Mongol Horde, of, of um, uh, Turkic peoples, but also combined with many other groups that had lived and existed in Crimea um, for centuries before their rival groups that had come and conquered Crimea or had settled in Crimea before that. And it was from all these many groups of peoples that a Crimean Tatar ethnic, ethnic identity coalesced during the time of the Crimean Khanate uh, in this period. So that's sort of the ethnogenesis, the, the origins of the Crimean Tatars as a distinct people. In 1783 it was annexed, um, what's now referred to as the first Russian annexation of Crimea um, under Catherine the Great, um, uh, when she captured a lot of the territory of now what's now southern Ukraine, including Crimea and it became a part of the Russian Empire at that time. During the Crimean War in the 1850s, it uh, was fought between the Russian Empire on one side with uh, the Ottoman Empire, France, and England on the other. Uh, Crimea was the, the uh, main theater of war in that conflict, and as a result, many people, uh, many lives were lost. Many of the Crimean Tatars who lived there fled the violence uh, heading to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and as a result, there's a now a large uh, Crimean Tatar diaspora in Turkey and Romania and other parts of the former Ottoman Empire. Uh, skipping ahead quite a ways, after the, the arrival of the Soviet period, Crimea became a uh, part of the Russian part of the Soviet Union in its early years. Um, following the uh, German occupation of Crimea and then its, its uh, uh, recapturing by the Red, Tro Red Army, uh, the Crimean Tatars were uh, charged with having collaborated en masse with the occupying Germans. Stalin declared that they were enemies of the Soviet people for having collaborated with the enemies and rounded them up all one by one, put them on train cars and deported them uh, primarily to Central Asia, to Uzbekistan, was the largest destination. So effectively, as of 1944, Crime Crimea was cleansed, ethnically cleansed of Crimean Tatars, and then we then, then saw waves of, of other Slavic peoples, more Slavic peoples coming and <coughs> taking their place. 
1954, uh, administrative authority over Crimea was transferred from the Russian part of the Soviet Union to the Ukrainian part. This is the date where Crimea becomes a part of Ukraine rather than Russia, but still at this time within the, the framework of the Soviet Union. It had little consequence at the time. It just meant that the chain of command now went through Kiev rather than directly to Moscow. This had uh, major consequences later on when the collapse of the Soviet Union. I should mention though first, about 1988, the Crimean Tatars are officially allowed to begin returning to Crimea after their years of deportation. They had maintained a strong uh, national movement advocating for their right to return to Crimea, to their homeland. They were continually denied by the Soviet authorities until the end of the perestroika, glasnost period, when they began trickling back. And then following Ukrainian independence in 1991, they began coming back in larger numbers. And so as of the last census, Ukrainian census taken in 2001, so this is already quite old, these, these numbers are a bit outdated, um, but about 60% of the population there is ethnically Russian, making it the only part, uh, the only region of Ukraine where Russian, ethnic Russians make up a majority of the population. 25% or so are ethnic Ukrainians, 12% Crimean Tatars at the time, and 3% are the minorities. I have some other images here. These are, this is a depiction of the deportation of the Crimean Tatars. And these are the settlements that Crimean Tatars created when they began returning to Crimea. They had returned to find that their former homes and lands were now occupied by others, by Russians, by Ukrainians, people who had not been themselves been living there for decades now and did not want to give up the homes that they now viewed as rightfully theirs. So in response, the Crimean Tatars began um, occupying unoccupied land, building these small structures, simple structures on former collective farms, lands that had fallen into disuse. And after a while, we were able to claim ownership of that land just by squatting on it for so long. And from this, we began to see large Crimean Tatar ghettos essentially building up along around major cities in Crimea. So they've had a difficult transition coming back to Crimea uh, to what was their first arrival in Ukraine. They, when, by the time they were removed from, from Crimea, Crimea was not a part of Ukraine. So when they came back, they were now finding themselves in, the, in an independent Ukraine uh, and struggling, as the rest of the country did, to get back on their feet. So that's some of the background. Um, you should also know that uh, during this period after Ukraine independence, Crimea was a scene of a lot of um, political contention. There was, because it has a large Russian population, it's where a lot of retired Soviet uh, military officers lived. There's a very strong pro-Soviet, pro-Russian identity among a lot of the Russians there. And they were quite upset, to say the least, that they found themselves in Ukraine rather than Russia when the Soviet Union collapsed. And as a result, there was a sustained nationalist movement, a separatist movement that sort of rose and fall over the course of the 90s and into the 2000s. This is an image I took in 2008 when I was there doing field work um, uh, on a Fulbright grant. This is a demonstration uh, supporting a particularly strong pro-Russian uh, political uh, candidate. Uh, Natalia Dietrenka is her name, you can see her there. You also see an image of Stalin here being held up by these largely elderly crowd, you might say. Uh, and the science is Sevastopol, the military base uh, for the still the Russian naval fleet. Uh, Sevastopol will not be a base for uh, NATO fleets, right? Protesting this idea that Ukraine would one day become part of NATO. So very, you know, anti-Western, anti-Ukrainian viewpoint of a lot of the ethnic um, Russians there. But at the same time, you've got the Crimean Tatars who have returned and who are struggling to become um, integral members of a new Ukraine uh, and continuing to demand for rights to land, uh, for assistance to help reestablish themselves in Crimea, and again held, holding their demonstrations commemorating May 18th in Crimea, and this is uh, from years past in Simferopol, in the capital of, Sim of Crimea, holding this commemoration for the day of deportation. And also at the same time, something that went rather unnoticed until just recently, is that Crimean Tatars very quickly uh, adapted to being Ukrainians. They very quickly became patriots of, an, of the Ukrainian state. This is something that most Ukrainians didn't realize that there was this ethnic minority now in Crimea that was by and large a very a group that supported Ukraine to a, to a large degree. They saw them as being a guarantor of their rights, uh, much more so than, than Russia could be. Uh, they saw them as a bulwark against potential revanchism or, or irredentism of the, of the Russian minority there. And very, very quickly adapted to, to being Ukrainians. And so this is a banner from a recent demonstration. It says Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians are brothers. Um, and I have to mention some of the previous work I did on Crimea that, that led up to my current work. Um, I have presented on this at least a couple times in this room. Some of you have seen me talk about it before, but I'll uh, just mention briefly. I did a, a survey in 2011 asking people about their identity. Crimea has a very strong sense of regional identity. Although people who live there have a very strong attachment to Crimea, particularly. And so I, I did a survey to sort of gauge people's senses of identity and how it's linked to Crimea, to Ukraine, to Russia, to these other 
uh, territorial and social factors. And among the, the questions I asked was this question, I asked people to draw a map of their homeland, give them a blank space and just use the term Rodina, the Russian word for homeland, to draw what your homeland is, and then sort of tallied up what this map scales were. And um, the most significant finding was that uh, either a majority or a plurality of people in most of these categories, of uh, ethnic categories, drew just Crimea as their homeland. Here's some examples with the Crimean Tatar Tomga symbol there on that one too. So people did not, these, these people who drew Crimea as their homeland didn't have a sense that Ukraine as a whole represented a homeland to them, that their identity was more closely tied to this region within Crimea. Crimean Tatars especially, they attribute their whole ethnogenesis, their whole existence as an ethnic community to being from Crimea. So for them, their, their attachment to Crimea is particularly strong. But even among Russians, and here I broke up, broke up Ukrainians into those who identified Russian as their first language and those who identified Ukrainian as their language, so Russified or non-Russified. And even among them, uh, many of them found that, uh, or believe that Crimea is their homeland rather than all of Ukraine. Of course, among Ukrainians, we do see large numbers identifying all of Ukraine as well. So there's some differences between who we're talking about here. But this is important to know that this idea of homeland is very closely associated with Crimea specifically for a lot of people from Crimea. And that's going to become important um, in the next round of, of work that I did that I'm gonna be talking about. Also need to mention briefly the events of 2013 and 2014 that led up to the work that I was doing. This is the, um, the Euromaidan, which uh, it's it, the third anniversary of the beginning of the Euromaidan just passed last week. So now we're in year three of the post-Euromaidan post Ukraine. So from November 21st to February 23rd, uh, demonstrators, particularly in the city of Kiev, in the main, the main square, but also in satellite demonstrations around Ukraine, um, held mass demonstrations in protest of President Yanukovych's decision not to sign an association agreement with the European Union that would have granted them um, closer economic and political ties with the EU and, may, and eventually leading to hopefully European, you know, your EU membership some way way down the road, seen as being sort of a first step towards that. The last minute he decided not to sign it and signaled that he was going to instead uh, get Ukraine to join this burgeoning Eur uh, Eurasian economic union that Russia had, had established as sort of a, a counterbalance to the European Union. This upset many Ukrainians who have become increasingly uh, European in their outlook, looking to Europe for their future. As, you know, they're, they're having, uh, imagining a future that is uh, tied with Europe rather than with Russia and with this, the Soviet um, uh, you know, mentality that they've been trying to escape. Um, so this went on until uh, February of 2014, um, ended with Yanukovych, of course, fleeing the country uh, in the dead of night, fleeing to Russia, and uh, the demonstration coming to an, an end with them having over gotten rid of the leader that they wanted to get rid of. So things were happy for a brief moment, but then in a couple days later, things started heating up in Crimea. On February 26, there was a large demonstration in front of the parliament building in Simferopol, in the capital of Crimea, between pro-Russian demonstrators and pro-Ukrainian demonstrators, among them many Crimean Tatars. You see an image here, people holding the flag of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. Generally, that's the pro-Russian side. And then you see Crimean Tatar and um, Ukrainian flags here on the other side. So it's a big mass of people. I think one person died of a heart attack in the Man, the people pushing up against each other, and it was a very tense situation. And overnight, that same night, appeared these guys that became affectionately referred to as the Little Green Men, um, soldiers in all this, this, you know, all this gear with weapons, with no uh, insignia, nothing on their uniforms that would indicate where they were from. Everyone who understood the situation understood that it, they were Russian troops in the very beginning, although Russia denied that they were so until after all this had been completed. Uh, but they showed up, they took, see, they seized uh, you, uh, Crimean's, Crimea's uh, infrastructure, they seized its, uh, the government buildings, they raised the Russian flag above the parliament building, took over its military bases, sectioned off the, the Ukrainian military forces that were, that were stationed there. Uh, and a few days later declared that, they were, that there was going to be a referendum held to decide what uh, Crimea's future should be, whether it should um, join Russia uh, now or later, essentially. The choices were between joining Russia immediately or reinstating an obscure, short-lived constitution, uh, Crimean constitution from the early 90s that gave Crimea the power to unilaterally separate from Ukraine, basically. So saying, let's, do you want us to, to join Russia now or later? And so they held this referendum on March 16th. I have referendum in air quotes here because it is not recognized as uh, legitimate by many authorities outside of Russia, right? It was held under an occupying force. It was held hastily, was put together, did not have an option for maintaining the status quo. So, you know, there's no, there's no real um, 
political authority beyond Russia that recognized this as legitimate. But of course, the results came back overwhelmingly in favor of joining Russia, something like 90 Eight percent of the population, or of, of the vote, said yes, we want to join Russia. Out of about eighty something percent of the population, by the official counts, that that, uh, that voted, there's been a lot of people who disputed those numbers. Uh, I would count myself among them, being skeptical, very skeptical of those results. But that's what Russia declared, and that's what they went off of. So two days later, they officially annexed Crimea, um, saying declaring it a part of, of Russia. Uh, and a couple months later, the same thing, same scenario sort of played out in eastern Ukraine uh, in the city of Donetsk, followed soon after by the city of Luhansk. Um, and we now have these separatist um, territories there as well. And that's a huge part of what's going on in Ukraine right now, but I won't be touching upon that so much uh, because I'm really focused on Crimea. So this has led to both, both the, the, the crisis in Crimea and in the Donbass <laughs> in eastern Ukraine have led to a crisis we now see in Ukraine. Um, we have uh, millions of internally displaced peoples, or IDPs. So as of June, uh, June of this year, this is the, la the uh, most recent date I, had f I could find figures for, uh, there are over 1.7 million registered IDPs in Ukraine. People have actually registered with the authorities as IDPs. There are certainly many more who have not registered as such. People, especially from Crimea, who have moved of their own volition and, are, and don't get really consider themselves to be displaced rather than just having moved, so they don't register as IDPs. But it's a very large number, um, the vast majority of which do come from eastern Ukraine. All right, I should point out right away that the number of internally displaced peoples from Crimea is a very small percentage of the overall uh, number of displaced peoples in Ukraine as a whole. And I'll get to some of the reasons why in just the, uh, the next slide. Um, but I have this uh, map that shows where we find IDPs in Ukraine. Uh, by and large, most of them, because they're coming from the Donbass area, from the occupied areas in eastern Ukraine, they haven't gone far. Most of them are still located within the areas of those uh, oblasts that are still under Ukrainian control. So basically just crossing the uh, boundary between separatist controlled territory and Ukrainian controlled territory. And they're living primarily there. Large numbers though have come to Kiev, to the capital. And there are um, thousands of, of IDPs in every region of, 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 Crimea, of Ukraine. So here's sort of a snapshot of where they are. Uh, as far as numbers of, of uh, IDPs from Crimea specifically, the official figure is around 20,000, though some activists have, have estimated it as, as high as 100,000. I'm a little skeptical of that number. I don't think it's quite that high, but I do think it's probably more than 20,000. So <laughs> it's difficult to say. We don't have a, a real clear idea of how many there are from Crimea. They're not all registered as IDPs. Um, it's, it's sort of vague. And so in general, IDPs from Crimea have left for different re reasons than those who have left from eastern Ukraine. Those in eastern Ukraine uh, face a violent conflict. There is an actual war going on between Ukrainian forces on the one side and a combination of separatist forces and actual <laughs> Russian military forces there, although Russia denies that they're there. But there's mountains of evidence that suggests they are. Uh, so there's an actual violent conflict happening there. People's homes are destroyed, neighborhoods are destroyed, people fear for their lives, and that has compelled millions to flee. Um, many have gone to Ukraine, others have gone to Russia as they've fled their homes. So those IDPs from eastern Ukraine have left under very dire circumstances. Uh, those from Crimea have not faced the same issues. There is no actual violent conflict in Crimea. There, is, there are cases of violence, small-scale violence against certain individuals. There have been kidnappings, beatings. Some people have been found killed um, under mysterious circumstances. So there's a sense of fear that has compelled <coughs> some to leave, particularly Crimean Tatars. But for the most part, people have left of their own volition. They've made a deliberate decision that they want to live in Ukraine, that they don't want to live under Russian occupation. They oppose the referendum, they oppose the occupation, and they feel better maintaining their identity as Ukrainian citizens and, and have, uh, for these reasons, mostly decided to um, leave Crimea. And I actually have some statistics from my survey that show some of the reasons why people left here coming up. There have been several organizations that have been founded in Ukraine to assist IDPs with legal assistance, with some financial assistance in some cases. Uh, so they offer psychological help, they offer help finding housing, finding jobs, a, a variety of services. Um, the Ukrainian government has offered some meager assistance to uh, IDPs. You can, uh, if you register, you are entitled to get a small stipend from the government. It's about $15 if you uh, are employed and about $30 a month if you are unemployed. So it doesn't really go a long way. It goes, it goes further in Ukraine than it would here, certainly, but, uh, but still a very small sum. So there have been a number of, of um, NGOs, private organizations that have filled the, the, the gap here, the void um, that the government's not doing. So uh, a couple of the primary ones, the ones that I ended up looking at a lot are Crimea SOS and Crimean Diaspora. And I have their logos here and so, uh, some logos of some other organizations too. 
Both of these organizations were founded before the conflict in eastern Ukraine started. It, found, it was started while the IDP situation only pertained to people from Crimea. So they have re retained these names about a Crimean, uh, Crimean IDPs. And um, I should note that this, my discovery of this organization online before I ever went to the field for this work, Crimean diaspora, got me thinking. This term diaspora jumped, at me, uh, jumped out at me as being rather strange. That they're calling themselves a diaspora even though they're within um, the state where they are still citizens. They haven't left Ukraine, they haven't crossed the international border, and traditionally diasporas are defined as being groups that have left their home country and have formed communities outside of it in another part of the world, in another country rather. So this, this is sort of what kicked me, what jump-started this project in my mind. I had, this is, this is my dissertation work I should point out, and I had initially been planning on doing a project in Siberia um, after my work in Crimea for my master's, but given the situation, it was going to be very difficult to do some kind of work in Siberia that I wanted to do in Russia. And I discovered this organization. It got me thinking about how have identities changed now for the people I studied before from Crimea, given the, the new circumstances. So I apologize, some of these slides are a little wordy, but um, more for me to read off of than, than for you to necessarily read. Um, but so it got me thinking, what effect have the Euromaidan, the annexation of Crimea, and the process of, interna of in, um, internal displacement that these people have gone through, how has this affected their identities? I know that they have a very strong attachment to Crimea based on my previous work. Well, how does that play out now? How have, has that uh, Crimean identity influenced their decision to leave, their decision to stay, and their relationship to Ukraine? So uh, along with this, uh, I started thinking about this question of diaspora. and Would they constitute a diaspora? Can we call them a diaspora within Ukraine? And so looking into some of the diaspora literature, I, I, I narrowed down these, some of these key elements that some of the diaspora scholars have identified as being essential to defining what a diaspora is. That there needs to be a sustained relationship to an estranged homeland, whether that's real or imagined. Right, so that's certainly something that, that is going on with the Crimean IDPs, right? We know many of them identify Crimea as their homeland, which from, from which they're now estranged. Uh, they tend to be ethnically cohesive, so they all tend to have a, a common ethnic identity, which problematizes this a little bit, because we know there are Ukrainians, Russians, Crimean Tatars among the IDP communities, so it might make for some cleavages in that community there. Uh, they also say that it's inherently transnational, i.e. that they have crossed an international border, as I said, that they now exist as a community outside of their home country in another country. Um, but there have been others who have challenged this framework as being too um, simplifying, too limiting or homogenizing of diasporic experiences, of the experiences of people who are compelled to migrate for one reason or another, particularly this criterion of being transnational. A few uh, geographers have argued that this um, is a problem as it reifies the nation state. It says, it sort of reifies this idea that um, international borders are the, the primary framework for which we can understand social and, and political phenomenon. This is something that uh, geographer John Agnew has famously called the territorial trap, our, um, our uh, tendency to look at the nation state as being the, the, the primary framework for this, that ignores the idea, as Kim Licka has, has described, that um, differences in race, ethnicity, language, culture, etc., can vary as much among populations within a, uh, a single state as across them. So if, if you know, we can have such strong differences among peoples within a state, why can't we have diasporas within a state if one cultural group uh, leaves their, their core area within that state and lives among another? So this raises questions about, about uh, this diaspora component of this research. And I've got a couple quotes here, one from our very own Professor Diener here, uh, my advisor as well, I should point out say from his, uh, his uh, a book on the uh, Kazakh, uh, excellent Kazakhs in Mongolia, he says that recreating homeland at sub-state scales of place are highly understudied and have vast potential to problematize traditional cons uh, conceptions of diaspora. So this is some of the work that got me thinking about this. I also have a quote from a recent work here on diaspora, that diaspora can be both evoked and revoked as a response to precarity, to the fraying of norms, to the dissolving of coherence of forms of national and ethnic attachment that are historically constituted but seemingly no longer produce a coherent collective consciousness. So there's a movement to think about diaspora as not simply as a, as a name to describe a community that may exist outside of its original state, but rather as a discourse for understanding this tension between belonging in a place and being out of place at the same time. And that's sort of the way I'm approaching this, that you know, diaspora is a way to approach and to talk about this tension between belonging and not belonging and being in place and out of place simultaneously. So this led me to my main research questions that I 
um, went into this project with, is how do Crimean IDPs retain, articulate, and perform Crimean identities? And how do these processes engender or inhibit their social assimilation within contemporary Ukraine? I also ask, in what ways and to what ends do displaced Crimeans engage with the concept of diaspora? I ask, what cultural and political factors influence the emergence, convergence, and or divergence of diasporic identities within and among diverse groups of Crimean IDPs? And how do Crimean IDPs conceive of a homeland following Crimea's annexation and their own displacement to mainland Ukraine? So building off of some of my previous work uh, in Crimea, this concept of homeland, and this new idea that I'm, I'm exploring with diaspora. So, this brings me to talking about my actual work I did. Um, here's some of my, some images of me in the field doing the work, my methodology. Uh, this was an ethnographic project. I did ethnographic field work uh, from September of, of last year to June of this year. This included interviews, focus groups, participant observations, and an online survey that I did. Uh, most of this was carried out in the cities of Kiev and Lviv, um, the capital of Kiev and Lviv in Western Ukraine, uh, which have become the two, emerges the two primary destinations for IDPs from Crimea. So here I am at a flash mob in Lviv uh, commemorating the anniversary of the arrival of the Little Green Men in Crimea. Uh, a couple of shots of me doing um, uh, focus groups. Uh, one, this is at the uh, Crimean Diaspora office. This is at a Crimean Tata restaurant, uh, visiting a hub, like a center for IDP uh, community activities in the city of Kherson in southern Ukraine. Uh, this is an interview with the founder of uh, Crimean Diaspora. I'll be talking more about him in a bit and in a small village in the Carpathians visiting some Crimean, um, traditional Muslim Crimean Tatar families that have lived here. So a variety of, of uh, field work activities here. Uh, I want to first talk about some of the results I got from the survey I did. I initially went into this not thinking I was going to do a survey. I was, I was focused more on ethnographic methods, uh, qualitative methods. I'd done a survey previously in Crimea and I wanted to try a different methodology, but by the end of my time there I realized I'd met so many people uh, so many IDPs. I was connected to so many of them through social media. They all use Facebook. I communicated through, with all of them through Facebook and I realized I could get a survey online to a lot of people really fast if I got some of these people to help me share it. So I got it out there and with a matter, a matter, within a matter of days I got over 500 responses. Um, and I should also point out again that we, because we don't really know, we don't have a clear image of this group, how many people there are, what their demographics are, we don't know what a representative sample of them would look like. So take this with a grain of salt. We don't know what, who exactly makes up this group of IDPs. But maybe this survey will give us some indication. So these are some results from my survey. Uh, about 47.7% respondents were men, 52.3 were women. The average age was 36.8, so rather young, right? It's, this is something that I did observe a lot, that most of the IDPs are younger, uh, younger people, many college students, many left to continue to study in college because uh, it's no longer feasible to do so. Uh, in Crimea and hope to have a degree that is recognized by any, <laughs> anyone outside of Russia. Um, I also want to jump over really quick to these pie graphs here. Uh, this showing the ethnographic, uh, eth or rather ethnic composition of the survey respondents. So about 22.3% uh, Russian, 25.8% Crimean Tatar, and we've got 44.7% Ukrainian. Now, I, I wonder if maybe some who might have Russian roots identified as Ukrainian in this, in this survey, right? They might, it's a little bit more fluid, uh, these identities between Russian and Ukrainian than between Crimean Tatars and those, for example. Um, but it was uh, surprising to me to see such a large chunk of that saying that they're ethnic Ukrainians. On the one hand, it does make sense that ethnic Ukrainians would feel um, less at home under Russian occupied Crimea and would decide to leave, but, um, but there are certainly many Ru Russians, ethnic Russians and Crimean Tatars who feel safer and, and more at home in Ukraine than in occupied Crimea. Um, also, education level was also very surprising. Uh, a small percentage of them only had a high school education. Uh, another small percent had a sort of vocational education. A bachelor's degree, about 11%, but then, oops, excuse me, about 66% uh, had a graduate degree or higher. Now this, is, this uh, was a large category that included like masters, ba uh, PhD, and different graduate categories that exist in sort of the, so the post-Soviet education system. Um, but regardless, this is a huge, huge chunk of, of, of the survey responses. And um, this speaks to the idea that it's, uh, in many ways, the intelligentsia, the, the, the educated um, who are leaving Crimea. It speaks to a certain um, phenomenon of the brain drain happening here among the Crimean population. So um, that's certainly an important component of this, looking at who's leaving. It, by and large, it tends to be people with, with greater education. Um, I also have some figures here on who people migrated with. We get a sense of the size of the family, the, the community that's leaving. About 30.5% migrated by themselves, came alone. 
43.5% uh, came with their spouse, 38.4% <laughs> with children, 5.5% uh, with their parents, 8.8% with their other family members, 65 with friends. So a variety of, of people leaving on their own or coming with, with various family members. And then here, getting back to the idea of why people left Crimea, I asked this question, I gave them the options, like why, what were the reasons you decided to leave Crimea to come, for, come to mainland Ukraine? And they could choose many options, so it's not, they didn't have to choose just one, they could pick as many as they wanted. Uh, but 33% left because of political, ethnic, or religious persecution. 71.2 left because of personal opposition to the occupation, so it's largely a political decision here, as we see. 37% left because of fears of their personal safety. 11.5 left to study in Ukrainian universities, as I mentioned, to continue their education in a univer uh, Ukrainian university. 28.4 left because of, a of lack of economic opportunities in Crimea. Russia as a whole is under uh, Western sanctions and Crimea is under uh, extra sanctions because of, of the occupation there. And so it's been rather stifling to the economic uh, growth there. So many have left um, to seek opportunity in mainland Ukraine. Uh, in addition to that, 6.9% left to continue or to open their own business, who found it difficult to continue working their own business or to start a new one in, in Crimea. And 13.9% uh, left before the occupation. So there is a segment of this, of this survey sample um, that we might not really call IDPs because they're from Crimea, but they had moved to the mainland of Ukraine before um, the annexation. Uh, so this figure, I asked... Um, what I, I gave a few categories that would be related to people's self-identity and asked how important are these factors to your, to your sense of self-identity and then broke it up between ethnic groups here. So we can see Ukrainian citizenship and living in Europe, both very high among all categories here. This speaks again to this idea that people left because they wanted to be, continue to be Ukrainian. They didn't want to live in Russia, have to trade in their Ukrainian passports for Russian passports as many have. Um, so there is a certain idea that, that those who have left Crimea did so because they identify as Ukrainian, they want to live in Ukraine, uh, continue supporting Ukraine. And uh, along with that, this idea that Ukraine is a, is a European country, that they want to move more towards um, European integration. And so we see both those categories being rather high among both groups. Being from Crimea, pretty high as a whole, but among Crimean Tatars, oops, certainly the highest. Again, this speaks to the ethnic attachment that Crimean Tatars have to Crimea that doesn't exist in the same way for other groups there. Uh, also, this is probably the most interesting result to me, ethnicity. Crimean Tatars, by far, were the group to say that their ethnic identity was most important. Uh, well, not necessarily most important, but a very important component of their identity. Um, it's less so among uh, Ukrainians, Russians, um, when, whereas we see their, their sort of civic identity, their, their status as Ukrainian citizens being so high, and many of them feel that their ethnic identity is less important. Um, although for Crimean Tatars, both their civic and their ethnic identity are very important. Same goes for religion. Crimean Tatars say that their religion, which is uh, their Sunni Islam, uh, is, is much more important than do all other categories here. So some very interesting um, things, especially when you get down to these ethnic and religious questions. So I want to talk about some of the uh, big picture findings that I, that I came away from this project with. Um, one of which is the new embrace of Crimean Tatars as an intrinsic component, intrinsic members of the Ukrainian civic nation. I mentioned that for much of uh, Ukraine's history since independence, there's been uh, a lot of misconceptions or ignorance about Crimean Tatars, who they are, who they what they represent. There have been fears among many Ukrainians that Crimean Tatars are separatists, that they're not, they don't support the Ukrainian state, that they, given the opportunity, <laughs> would move for Crimea to join Turkey, for example. There's a lot of close historic and ethnic and linguistic and cultural ties between Crimean Tatars and Turkey. Um, so there have been speculation that they would rather be with Turkey than Ukraine, right? Um, but once the Euromaidan happened and when the Crimean version of the Euromaidan happened, there were demonstrations there too, uh, it became apparent that Crimean Tatars were by and large the, the group in Crimea that was most supportive of Ukraine. They were the ones who were most advocating for uh, Crimea to remain a part of Ukraine, supporting the European ambitions of the Euromaidan. They emerged as the strongest supporters here among, among the, Ukrainian, uh, the Crimean population. And this is something that's not gone unnoticed by the average Ukrainians. There's been a whole new embrace and, and celebration and admiration of Crimean Tatars and Crimean Tatar culture nowadays in, in mainland Ukraine. Here's another shot from that demonstration, May 18th. Uh, the one letter's cut off, it says Crimean Tatars, this is in Ukrainian. Crimean Tatars are the indigenous people of, of Ukraine or an indigenous people of Ukraine. So acknowledging, I guess they are as much, you know, they belong to this country as much as we ethnic Ukrainians do. 
And uh, it's hard to tell here. I've got, this is a Crimean Tatar man I met who actually still lives in Crimea, but had come up for an event in, uh, in Kiev. And he's wearing a Vishivanka, which is a traditional Ukrainian uh, shirt. And it's embroidered here with both the Trizub and the Tamga, the national symbols of both Ukraine and um, the Crimean Tatars. And we see those two symbols interlocked here in this badge being worn by, this is Lenur Islamov, who is a rich Crimean Tatar businessman, owner of the uh, ATR, the Crimean Tatar um, television network that uh, was shut down in Crimea and now is relocated to Kiev. Uh, this is not my picture, this is him down on the, the border. He had established a Crimean Tatar battalion to uh, monitor the situation on the border, rather controversially. Um, but this is also a, uh, an o a new uh, center that's been opened in Kiev called the Crimean House, sort of a center for displaying art um, and, and uh, uh, performances by and for Crimeans living in Kiev. So again, we see the Trizub and the Tamga, uh, both the Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar national symbols displayed here. Uh, I've got some quotes here, and don't, but I'll, I'll read them out for you. But this is from uh, Rafat Chubarov, who is a member of the Ukrainian parliament and also leader of the Mejlis, the national uh, body of the Crimean Tatars. And in my interview with him, I asked him about these questions about the role of Crimean Tatars in Ukraine now. It says that after the tragedy that was the occupation of Crimea, Ukrainians started to better understand the Crimean Tatars. Many of the negative myths surrounding Crimean Tatars necessarily disappeared with the occupation. Before, there were many in Ukraine who believed that Crimean Tatars posed a threat to Ukraine, that they are potential separatists. Many in Ukraine thought that their relationship with Russia and Russians ass uh, assured a certain Slavic unity, that it would uh, guarantee a peaceful future. As it turns out, it was the other way around. Those who were considered separatists emerged as the only ones who stood up and defended the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And those who were considered brothers turned out to be enemies. The relationship towards Crimean Tatars and understanding of Crimean Tatars became much better. I also have a quote from a friend of mine, uh, Suleiman, who is uh, a member of the, the world's only Crimean Tatar punk band, as I like to point out. Um, <laughs> He says, I see the change in the Kiev community. Their relationship to Crimean Tatars has really changed. Everyone knows about Crimean Tatars. They talk about Crimean Tatars, about IDPs from Crimea, practically all now. Many people really know that there is such an ethnic group that lives in Crimea and indigenous to Crimea. There's a real sense that they are embraced now in a whole new way. And another reflection of this is the explosion in Crimean Tatar restaurants and cafes and Crimean themed uh, restaurants uh, uh, around Ukraine. So this is probably the, the, the most important one. This is Musafir, um, located in, in Kiev. It's sort of become the de facto center of, of Crimean Tatar life in Kiev, if you will. Um, but we've got some others. This is in a small town called Drohobych in western Ukraine, near Lviv, a um, small stand open in the market. This is in, in, um, in um, Kherson in southern Ukraine. This is a, not Crimean Tatar, but just a Crimean, generally Crimean cafe in Lviv. We have a stand selling chiburiki, the famous Crimean Tatar uh, food, sort of a meat, fried meat pie, um, a little stand in Kiev, and um, you know, some signs for some other restaurants too. So there have been many. Before in Kiev, there was the one Crimean Tatar restaurant down the main square in, uh, in Kiev, but uh, since then there have been many that have opened up. Since I've gotten back from the field, I see online there are more opening up since then too. So there's a real explosion here. People are interested in the food, want to, want to support Crimean Tatars and are going out to these restaurants. And of course, the, maybe the one single um, moment that really demonstrates the new role of Crimean Tatars in, in Ukraine is the victory of Crimean Tatar singer Jamala in the Eurovision Song Contest this year. Right? This is the big European-wide song contest where every country in Europe chooses a singer and a song to represent them and then they, they all compete in, in one city. This year it was in Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, Jamala, here, Crimean Tatar singer, or as she always says in interviews, a Ukrainian sitter, singer of Crimean Tatar heritage. It's very important that people understand that, that she's Ukrainian, not just Crimean Tatar. Um, she had a song called 1944, which as you may recall is the year of the deportation of the Crimean Tatars. So it was a song about the deportation, and it was a very big deal to Crimean Tatars to have one of their own singing about this tragedy on this uh, stage, a European stage for all of Europe to hear. And the lyrics were in English and in Crimean Tatar. So not only is she singing about their tragedy, but she's singing in their language. And many people are hearing it for the first time. And it came down to the Russian singer in the final round. There was all this drama and it was, it was like right out of a movie. Uh, but here she is, Victor, and here she is with uh, Ukrainian President Poroshenko, Petro Poroshenko, after, after it was being given this title of like hero of Ukraine or something like that. Um, so that's one of the main points, is the new role of Crimean Tatars. But I also want to point out some of the, um, 
ways we see unity and division among the IDP, uh, Crimean IDP community. Uh, there is a, a real sense that there's a, a lot of solidarity among them, that they all chose to be Ukrainians. They all chose to leave Ukraine or Crimea to come to the mainland to continue to fight for the return of Crimea. There's a lot of activism, a lot of political um, ideologies wrapped up in this. But there's a real sense of solidarity across ethnic lines in many cases. So this is uh, Tamila Tasheva, one of the co-founders of, of uh, Crimea SOS, one of the main organizations helping IDPs. She told me that the people who left Crimea are those who have patriotic feelings towards the Ukrainian government. And this was the main factor. Not whether you are Crimean Tatar Slavic, but whether or not you have some kind of pro-Ukrainian position. This is the main factor uniting these two subgroups of Crimean IDPs. And I also have a quote from my friend Sirdar, briefly roommates in Lviv. I've known him uh, for many years. We met in Crimea um, uh, in 2011 when I did my work there, and he was one of my main uh, contacts and helpers this past year. Um, he told me that the community of IDPs, Russians, Ukrainians, and Crimean Tatars, there should be, uh, never, never be any discussion about difference between them, uh, because Russia might exploit them. Russian agents are trying to find the differences and use them. It might be religious differences, it might be linguistic differences, but they are always doing that. That's how separatism is working. In a time of war with separatists in our homeland, there should not be any separatism in our community of IDPs. Right? So they, do, they need to show this solidarity, they need to present a united front against the, the occupation and against what's happening in their, in their homeland. Um, but you, on the one hand, there is a sense of unity, of solidarity, but there are some, some cleavages, some differences here. And um, highlighting these two organizations actually speaks to these, these cleavages quite well. So on the one hand, you've got Crimea SOS, which was founded by three Crimean Tatars. Here's, again, Tamila Tasheva, uh, along with uh, Sevgil Musayeva, who is the uh, editor-in-chief of uh, Ukrainskaya Pravda, which is one of the main um, newspaper news sources in Ukraine, and Alim Aliyev, who, who is the, the leader in Lviv, their Lviv office. Um, and they are founded by Crimean, Crimean Tatars and, and focus a lot on Crimean Tatar issues. They also have a sort of activist and um, media wing to this organization. They, they produce, uh, you know, uh, articles online, they put out news briefings, and they have a very activist bent to them. And they, as Tamila told me, they focus specifically on, the, on Crimean Tatar issues because they, they see that there is no other advocate for them, really, that they, they need people focusing on their issues specifically. So there's one group, they, they're, I should say they're open to everyone, right? There's, you don't have to be Crimean Tatar to come to them for assistance. They help everyone. They help primarily people from the Donbass now because there's so many more IDPs from Eastern Ukraine than there are from Crimea. But their, their doors are open to everybody, but they do really focus on the Crimean Tatar issues. Uh, and on the other hand, you've got Crimean Diaspora, the one founded by this guy, Anatoly Zasoba, who's from Sevastopol, a very Russian city in Crimea. And his, everyone who works there is also uh, ethnically Russian or Ukrainian. And all the times I was there in the office, I don't think I ever saw a single Crimean Tatar there. And it's not that they're trying to exclude them either. They present themselves as being an organization open to everybody too. But there seems to be some self-selection here among where these, these groups gravitate towards. Um, and there's some contention here. Actually, Tamila, when I asked her about this other organization, Crimean Diaspora, she said, oh, we don't really work with them like we do with other organizations because they have some ideological differences. Um, they see Crimean Diaspora as being focused on sort of economic issues in a, in a strange way, that they encourage people actually to sell their property in Crimea to try to purchase new homes in mainland Ukraine, something that they're opposed to. They, they, they advocate for maintaining those connections to Crimea. Uh, she's also opposed to the name Crimean Diaspora itself, as I'll get to in a little bit, and what, what that name implies. And this gets back to the diaspora question. But so there is some, some sort of, you know, this, some tension between these two groups, a sort of poles um, separating these two different ideologies among IDPs. And again, I apologize for the wordiness. One of these is a quote that I'll read off of. But one of the most contentious issues that has emerged among the IDP communities is this hypothetical idea of what's going to happen to Crimea if and when it returns to, to Ukraine uh, and what kind of political status it should have. And there is uh, a big push among Crimean Tatars, especially now, to advocate for the creation of a Crimean Tatar national autonomy. Now, Crimea was an autonomous republic in Ukraine before the annexation, but that wasn't based on the presence of, of an ethnic minority like so many autonomous regions of Russia, for example, are. Um, and so there's this, they're advocating now for the creation of, of, a, of an autonomous republic that would be sort of by and for the Crimean Tatars in certain ways, that would enshrine their rights to their language and to their culture within the constitution of the autonomous republic. Um, but this is a very contentious issue, and this is one of the questions I asked in my survey, is do you support the creation of a Crimean Tatar national autonomy? And 83.7% of Crimean Tatars said yes, absolutely. 
whereas only 39.3% of ethnic Russians, 40.2% of Ukrainians, and just over half of other minority groups said, no, we don't support that. There's a lot of um, miscommunication and misunderstanding of what this would actually mean. People fear that it's, oh, it's going to, you know, make non-Crimean Tatar second-class citizens in, in Crimea. There's, there's a real lack of understanding of what it would mean. And I have a quote here from Mustafa Jamilev, who is a very, very, very famous um, political leader of the Crimean Tatar. He's also a member of the Ukrainian parliament, um, but was the leading figure in the Crimean Tatar national movement all throughout its history in, uh, during the deportation. Has a world record for the longest hunger strike uh, in the world and to, to um, protest the, the Crimean Tatars not being able to return to Crimea in the Soviet period. And I did get to interview him a couple times. And so here he is talking about what a, a Crimean Tatar national autonomy would be like. So today there's a lot of discussion about the fact that after de deoccupation, after the turn of Crimea to Ukraine, a reconfigured autonomous republic will be created that is national territorial in character. But this does not mean that Crimean Tatars should have more rights only because they are Crimean Tatars. Simply put, in the constitution of the autonomous republic, it should be stated that this republic represents the realization of the right to self-determination of the indigenous peoples of Crimea. Some mechanism should be put into place to protect their rights, not to di uh, dictate to anybody else their own rights, but in fact to protect theirs too. First of all, this should mean that Crimean Tatar is one of the official languages, a functional language, otherwise it is doomed to disappear. Secondly, a mechanism should be provided for the representation of Crimean Tatars in all structures of power so as to protect their rights. This could be achieved either through the power of veto or through some kind of proportional representation that will allow them to defend their rights. This is what we need to work on now. So this is him sort of outlining a basic outline of what a, a, their national autonomy could look like. But then I bring back um, Anatoly Zasoba again, founder of Crimean Diaspora, who appeared to be one of the leading figures advocating against this idea. And this is what he told me about it. It says, Crimea will not return to Crimea in the same form that it was before. In the event that Russia retreats from Crimea, it's now assumed that it will be handed over to the Crimean Tatars and made into a Crimean Tatar national autonomy within Ukraine. That means it will look something like a state within a state, with the Crimean Tatars recognized as indigenous people and possessing the right to self-determination. And knowing their temperament, this is maybe not the best translation of this word, it sound, makes it sound more racist than maybe <laughs> it really is, but knowing their temperament, this will likely mean the desire to either separate and become a Crimean state, a Crimean Tatar state, or to possibly unite with Turkey. We can't rule that out either. So here's that same stereotype, that same misconception that it existed for, for decades now among a lot of Ukrainians that had largely been dispelled after the Euromaidan, when people saw oh, Crimean Tatars support Ukraine so strongly, but even a fellow Crimean himself still sort of using the same old line, this fear that, that secretly the Crimean Tatars want to undermine Ukraine and ultimately move to, to Turkey, perhaps. So this, while there is a, good, a great sense of unity generally among Crimean IDPs, this is sort of the one issue that seems to be the most contentious. And luckily it's all hypothetical at this point, right? There's, it's a big if and a big win as far as when, if and when Crimean Tatar is go, uh, Crimea is going to return to, Crimea, to Ukraine again. But in the meantime, they've got some time to stew this over and, and hash out what it would really mean. And of course, there's the diaspora question and whether or not we can call this group a diaspora. And I actually asked this question in my survey. I said, do you consider yourself a member of a diaspora of Crimeans or of Crimean Tatars, as it were? And amazingly, the results were split almost exactly three ways, right? Just about a third said yes, a third said no, and a third said difficult to answer. So that doesn't really help, <laughs> help us understand how they see themselves, right? It's, it's a, a lot of contention. Uh, but I pulled out some quotes. I also allowed people to provide an explanation for their answer. And these are quotes <laughs> from people who said, no, we're not a diaspora. It says, a diaspora is a community of co-nationals beyond the borders of their own country. I'm, in, I'm a Ukrainian and I'm in Ukraine. There does not exist a separate Crimean Ukrainian or Crimean nationality that is distinguishable from non-Crimean Ukrainians, right? It's a good point. Uh, another says diaspora equals living in a different country and Crimea equals Ukraine. So there's that. And I said, I don't consider myself a diaspora since I am a citizen of Ukraine located in the territory of my own state and Crimea is Ukraine. I also have a quote here from um, uh, Amine Japar. She's a Crimean Tatar woman, first deputy minister of the information of uh, Ministry of Information Policy in Ukraine. She told me that I think diaspora is somewhere out of Ukraine because still we are the citizens of Ukraine, so we cannot consider ourselves diaspora here. Of course, our homeland is Crimea, but when, uh, whenever we are within the territory of Ukraine, we cannot say that we are diaspora. So diaspora is somewhere in Turkey, Romania, let's say United States. All those Crimean Tatars living there are diaspora, but those who are here, they are citizens of Ukraine. So there's sort of this second category that she's talking about maybe. There's those in Crimea, there's those in the diaspora, and there's those in Ukraine, but not in Crimea. Um, but it also shows that this idea that you can't be a diaspora unless you've tr crossed an international border is really deeply entrenched in the minds of a lot of people. Like, no, what diaspora means you're outside of your country and we're still in our country. So that is there, certainly. Uh, got time, okay. I added this slide. 
for sort of last minute. Um, so I want to talk about the political implications of calling this a diaspora. And uh, also relates to this idea of refugees versus IDPs. And I will quote again from Tamila Tashava, co-founder of, of Crimea SOS. She says, I don't like the term Crimean refugees because IDPs are not refugees. This isn't just a word. It signifies that you've made a distinction, that Crimea is Russia and the remaining part is Ukraine. Accordingly, those people who have come from Russia, Russian Crimea would now be considered refugees because they crossed an international border. They did not cross an international border. We do not have an international border with Crimea. To use the word refugee or diaspora, this is not the correct position. It then forms an incorrect understanding among the people. People should understand that this is our territory. We are not refugees because Crimea is the territory of the Ukrainian state. You could only be a refugee if you flee to Poland and request refugee status and all the rest. This idea that to say that there is a diaspora community in mainland Ukraine is by default to say that Crimea is not Ukraine and the understanding of these people who have you know, held on to this understanding that a, a diaspora can only exist outside of a country. So well, if there's a diaspora here, that means that where they came from is not part of this country. Right? So this is something I hadn't thought about before I went into this, the political implications, if you call it a diaspora, what that means, um, what that says about Crimea's relationship to Ukraine now. And this, this is not the same person, this is another a journalist, Olga Duchnich, who I actually did also interview um, in this ad campaign. It says, Crimea is Ukraine, and I am a citizen of Ukraine. You know, emphasizing the idea that we are still here, we may not be in our small homeland, but we're Ukrainians and we're here now. All right, and though, I have one last slide to talk about this. On the other hand, there were people who said that, yeah, I think we, we could be called a diaspora. And so, for example, this guy, this is Pavel Kazarin. He's a journalist, prominent Crime, uh, Crimean journalist, ethnic Russian, had lived in Russia for a few years, working there before the Euromaidan when he came back to Ukraine to support Ukraine. He told me that when we meet another Crimean in Ukraine, in Kiev, in Zaporizhia, in any city, if I meet another Crimean, I understand that he is probably a like-minded person, that he left the peninsula because he didn't accept the annexation. And I don't feel apprehensive when I begin to speak with him. For a person from Donetsk in Kiev, when he meets another person from Donetsk, he isn't necessarily a like-minded person. Uh, we are like-minded and we are few, so we cherish our meetings with each other. We have a lot to talk about. We have a lot of nostalgic moments to discuss, things to chat about. Therefore, a diaspora format is possible because this is a diaspora of like-minded people. We aren't just united by geography, we are united by values. So this idea that it's not just where you're from, but it's, your, it's how you view the world. It's how you understand the situation that, that can you know, be a grounds for coalescing as a diaspora community, which I thought was really interesting. And then again, some quotes from people who told me that, yes, they are part of a diaspora in that survey. It says, Crimea is my homeland. I lived there for 40 years, and I plan to be there often after the occupation. Crimea is my homeland. Ukrainians from Crimea uh, and Tatars have a common misfortune, the occupation. <coughs> so again, focusing on that aspect of homeland, that if you're outside of your homeland, then you can be considered a diaspora. Even if you're still in Ukraine, if you, if you view Crimea as your homeland, then you know, you're then part of a diaspora. Um, and my last thing here, I, I, I should leave time for questions. I'm not gonna show this, but I, I had, was gonna show a clip from this other interesting thing I got to do, which was be in a short documentary film about the Crimean Tatars and, uh, their, and the annexation. Um, and I was gonna show a clip of me interviewing Mustafa Jamila that was from this and him watching Jamala performing on TV, which is a really touching moment. But I'll skip it for now. It's online, you can find it. Um, I'll wrap it up here and take your questions instead. Thank you. Yes? I don't see Russia ever taking <coughs> back Crimea, at least not in our lifetimes. And I'm wondering, are, have you seen any reverse movement of these IDPs going from Ukraine proper back to Crimea? Mm, not really. I should say, though, that many people do go back, like, to visit. That's, the border is fairly porous. It's very, you know, it's, it's a very, Russia has thrown up a big, uh, uh, you know, border crossing there. It's a hassle to cross, but people do go back and forth a lot. People go and visit their families. So there is a lot of movement across the border. Um, but I haven't seen anyone who, or talked to anyone who has decided that they're going to move back permanently still. The majority of people I asked if they would return to Crimea, they said yes when it's back in Ukraine. So for the most part, people are ready to stay in the mainland until Crimea is, is, is brought back to to Ukraine, I get, but I, I, I tend to agree that I don't, I don't think we're going to see that happen anytime soon. I think it would take a major um, change in Russia proper. It would take basically the collapse of, of the Russian state in order for Crimea to, to be brought back to Ukraine in anytime soon, unfortunately. If I just could piggyback on this, just to give an anecdotal information, mm -hmm. at ASI's convention in Washington, I met with a friend who is a graduate student at Northwestern, who is an ethnic, ethnic Ukrainian from Crimea. Oh, wow. And uh, 
he went to non-occupied part of Crimea this summer, and his parents came out and visited him, because his parents are still in the, in the occupied territory. Oh, wow. His parents told him that they felt that it wouldn't be safe for him, as a Ukrainian with you know with an American student visa in his passport yeah. to go into the Russian occupied territory. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, there's, I actually just saw a news item this morning. Um, two days ago, there was a big concert in Kiev. It's called, uh, it was a Crimean Tatar, a celebration of all things Crimean Tatar, basically. Jamala was there, all these other Crimean Tatar singers were there, and a Crimean Tatar rap group actually came up from Crimea to, to perform. Uh, and I just thought that they were uh, detained and questioned, and uh, I think some were, were still under, under custody. Last I, I read that uh, when they returned back, that they had, you know, been doing activities that the, the authorities there were not happy about. And so there's always that threat. I have friends who cross that border a lot, and they're always a little bit nervous, like, what's going to happen this time if I go across? Are they going to, you know, see that I maybe said this on, in, online or that, uh, you know, I was involved in this activity? So there was always this apprehension about, about tra traveling. And sometimes I think, like, it was this trip back going to be my last, you know? On your, when you were on the slides, you said there were 60% Russians in Ukraine. What percentage of those are IDPs? Um, within Crimea? Yeah. Um, I think a very small number of actual ethnic Russians have, have left. I mean, that one figure I showed from my survey about the ethnic makeup of the IDPs showed it was I think, I think a 20, little over 20% were Russian. Um, although I think maybe there were some more ethnic Russians who were part of that large Ukrainian chunk um, and decided to, to, to identify themselves as Ukrainian instead. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are by and large ethnic Russians. There are happy with the with the annexation. Um, there's a lot of joy among the Russian population there when it happened. And despite uh, hardships, despite the sanctions, despite being shut off from the rest of the world, despite having their energy cut off for a while too by activists on the Ukrainian side, they seem to be pretty resilient in their in their uh, you know happiness with, with with what's happened there. Some have lost their their. Um, Enthusiasm, I've heard. I've heard anecdotally that, you know, people are starting to like, okay, well, maybe this wasn't the best idea, but there's still the imperative that they need to at least appear to be happy. If they, if they speak up in Crimea, if they say that, they, that Crimea should be part of Ukraine, if they challenge the territorial integrity of Russia, that they could be subject to fines or prison time now. So they have to be careful. Yeah? Uh, for. All of us, perhaps, uh, could you comment whether in your discussion, uh, in do your field work and the analysis, you're looking at the situation at uh, the activists that were imprisoned by Russia, uh, like Alex Sov, the famous mm -hmm. film director, and uh, people whom the Russians have released, uh, like uh, Gennady mm -hmm. uh, who actually was released and he was able to come back to Ukraine. Yeah, and he's a prominent activist now and among them, yeah. Um, you had discussions around that uh, in your field work? I mean, this, is this the topic that came up? A little bit, yeah. One of, um, one of the daughters of one of the main people at Crimean Diaspora uh, was a good friend of um, uh, Alexander Kolchenko, who was one of the other a friend of Sensov yeah. who had been arrested with them, and they, I went to a screening of Sensov's film, Gamer, at the Crimean Diaspora office, and they had a discussion afterwards with her and some of her friends who were part of the Antifa, the anti-fascist movement, uh, with this guy Kolchenko, who's now a political prisoner in Russia, and sort of talking about him and his life and his work and what happened there. So there's, yeah, there is a sense of the injustice that's happened that, uh, surrounding the um, political, pri political prisoners. Um, there, I also went to an event at the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs building where they had a bunch of portraits of all the political prisoners from um, Crimea up, and they had some, you know, prominent pol politicians talking about it, and all the media was there. So there was an effort to, to keep attention on the political prisoner situation. Uh, one of another one was just released the other day. The son of Mustafa Jamilov, actually, Heiser um, uh, Jamilov, who had actually been in prison in Crimea before the annexation. He had actually accused of murder. Um, I don't know the situation surrounding. One of my, my friends, Serdar, actually is like, oh yeah, well he's actually probably guilty of that, so he should be <laughs> present. But but he was brought to Russia, and I, I don't know all the, the details about it, but he was just released. And they had been keeping him to sort of keep the pressure on Mustafa Jamilov, and he's a rock, and he was like, you know, like, yeah, they will suck for, him, for my son, but, <laughs> but we're not gonna cave or anything. So they finally released him, and there's some pictures of him reunited with his father just from the other day. 
actually, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. The uh, Tatars, are they pushing ahead with autonomy regardless of whether or not Crimea returns, or is, does it have to be in Crimea? Well, they, I mean, they are sort of advocating the government, and President Poroshenko seems to maybe be on board with this to try to maybe enshrine this in the Constitution, yeah. So there's a lot of activism surrounding that. Of course, it would be only uh, symbolic if they were to establish it now. It would have no real impact on the situation in Crimea. But there is an effort to, to keep the conversation going, to, to keep this in the forefront of people's minds, those who are, who are active in, in, in these issues. So. It is. It hasn't led to any real serious, you know, conflict among the IDP community as I've seen. I've seen some pretty passioned, impassioned pleas on either side for why it should or should not be established. But um, otherwise, it's still just sort of a hypothetical discussion. Yeah. You know? How pliable is the Crimea the way it is now? How? I mean, yeah, viable. I mean, in, in with all sense. the sanctions and everything, and how people working, you know. Um, I mean, it's, it still is running in, in, in some capacity. People aren't all able to access money, but like credit cards don't work there, ATMs don't work. It's sort of reverted to a uh, sort of black market economy in some ways, and it, they, they have had to adapt to being shut off from, from where their, their only link is the ferry link. Um, Russian banks are working. What's that? The Russian banks are working. The Russian banks are working, yeah, but, but if you want to you know, have a, like a visa or something, it's, it's not working so well. They are building this bridge. Um, to the mainland, this was their top priority once the, the annexation went through. Um, there's a lot of speculation that, you know, a lot of skepticism that that, that bridge is even going to be able to be completed. It's not a very um, uh, effective place to build a bridge. The, there's a lot of silt at the bottom, supposedly. It's a very far. The carriage, yeah. So they're, they're moving forward and they're supposed to be done with it by like 2018 or 2019. So we'll have something to keep an eye on if it's, it's going to give them an actual lifeline to, to, to Russia or not. Is the international community ever going to cave in and say okay? Well, that remains to be seen now with our uh, president-elect. I have a, I have a uh, you know, ominous feeling that maybe that Putin can say, oh, yeah, I'll let you build some, some hotels in Moscow if you, if you recognize well, the annotation. Yeah, I, I don't want to get too plug here, but I, I, I wouldn't put it, <laughs> put it past him. So, yeah, that, that's one of my, my big fears that's come out of this election cycle. What's going to happen vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and Crimea specifically? You know? And was Crimea largely 60% like Russian early on when, when were there a lot of Russians there before the, the Soviet before the, revolution? The, before the Soviet revolution? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was still, at that time, I think Crimean Tatars made, still made up at least half the population. It was a gradual process of displacement, beginning with the first annexation and then the Crimean War. A lot of Crimean Tatars fled that time, but there were still a lot of them in Crimea um, up until their deportation. And it was at that time that they were completely eradicated from Crimea, basically. And then, of course, the other uh, <coughs> traditional ethnic groups were deported as well. Like yeah. uh, Crimean Greeks were deported. Greeks, Armenians and Bulgarians. Armenians and, and Bulgarians. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, the, you know, the impact of the Holocaust and then the old ethnic German settlements. Yep. And, so. Yeah, there's a long history of displacement of peoples in the Soviet Union as a so whole. Yeah. Very, very mixed and diverse place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's also the other indigenous people, the very, very tiny groups indigenous to Crimea, the Karaites uh, and the Krimchaks, only a few thousand of them total. I did uh, interview one um, Krimchak IDP uh, in Lviv who's a, a lawyer for uh, the Crimea SOS office there. So he's <laughs> he represents like 1% of the whole population <laughs> of, the, of the, practically, not quite, but uh, um, yeah, so there are, Crimea is a very, very diverse place, yeah, mm -hmm. has been at least. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much for, for, for being here.